Okay. okay. Hypothetical for you. Mm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say yeah. we're at a party. Mm -hmm. Maxwell's playing. Love him. You don't know me. Mm -hmm. I don't know you. And I ask you out on a date. Would you say yes? Hi, I'm Jim Pasco, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this 92nd Street Y Talks event with the cast and creators of the third season of the Netflix critically acclaimed comedy series, Master of None. Joining us are co-creator, executive producer, writer and director, Aziz Ansari, co-creator and executive producer, Alan Yang, executive producer, writer and actress, Lena Waith, who plays Denise, and executive producer and actress, Naomi Aki, who plays Alicia. Welcome all. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm honored to be able to moderate this discussion and uh, let's just jump right in. Uh, Aziz, Talk us through your inspiration to return back to Master of None after a four-year hiatus. Um, you know, I think Alan and I, you know, we would even say like, oh, we don't even know if we want to do a third season, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, secretly we're always having conversations because for us, it's, it's such an amazing platform, um, to have a show on Netflix like Master of None and, you know, the audience that we built. And it's just, you know, it's a great playground for us. So every now and then we would talk about little ideas. And at a certain point we had enough. And at, at one point it kind of, you know, the idea for Moments in Love crystallized in my head. And, and uh, I remember calling Alan and just kind of pitching like the basic idea. And he was like, that, that sounds pretty cool. That sounds like it's worth bringing it back. And, um, and then I called Lena and she was in and then the wheels started turning uh, from there and the train kind of started leaving the station. I think for us, the challenge was, you know, when we did season one, you know, this type of show wasn't as common, you know, like the idea of me even starring in the show as, you know, an Indian guy was like, what? He's the main guy. There's not another <laughs> What, wait, there's another white guy that's like the main person, right? He's just his friend, right? I mean, it, it, like, and now you can't watch a show with a white guy. I think you'll get in trouble. <laughs> like, so so it's like things have changed so much. And, you know, when we did the first season, the idea of like, oh, let's do this kind of, you know, uh, single camera show that that is trying to be cinematic and, and try some bold things like, you know, you know, focus on a side character for an episode, like, all that stuff was is, was very new then. And now it's like, you know, you see that more often. So for us, it was like, well, how do we do something that feels new to us and doesn't feel like we're just kind of doing what we used to do? So, yeah, I think that was a challenge and, and, and part of the reason why we took our time. Alan, following up on that, the, these initial discussions that, that Aziz mentioned, um, was there anything specific that you knew you wanted to do? Um, any initial thoughts on when uh, Aziz, you know, gave you that call and pitched this idea to you? I think it was prefaced basically by what we didn't want to do. And I, I think the watchword of the show has always been, you don't want to repeat yourself. You don't want to make a show just for the sake of making a show. Here's a season just because we have a show, right? Mm -hmm. We always kind of saw the show as a way to challenge ourselves and do something new and do something different. I think that's illustrated in the first two seasons as well, right? It was like, well, what's something that not only we haven't seen on TV before, but we ourselves haven't done. And so that's why between season two and three, which was obviously a pretty long layoff, we had all these ideas, but it's like, which one is actually exciting enough to us? And, and, and like, as he said, 
what could be as surprising as that first season or as that second season. And in this case, it was like, well, yeah, let's put the focus on Denise's character. We had talked about an idea similar to this as early as season one. And there's an episode called Mornings with, uh, with Deb's character and Rachel's character. And it's like, you know what would be fun is let's see Denise's mornings. Let's see a relationship that isn't necessarily a straight man and a straight woman. And, um, you know, obviously in the second season, we did the Thanksgiving episode. And it's like, wow, this character has so much depth to us and so much sort of history to it we definitely thought it could sustain a season. And, and of course, after we started discussing it, we got Lena involved and it was like, she was on board. It was, it, it was kind of a no brainer from there. It was like, we have so much material to mine. And it was honestly so much more exciting to us than like, yeah, let's, let's, let's have a guy bouncing around New York eating tacos again. You know, although that would have been fun. Um, we felt like this was more creatively exciting. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, and and thank you for queuing that up. Uh, you know, Thanksgiving to me feels very much almost like a a a, a, pre, a preface to this season. Uh, you know, because it's this episode that focuses you know, specifically on Denise, but you know, obviously Denise and uh, and Dev's relationship. Lena, uh, what was it like collaborating a, again, uh, building off of that? success of that episode. I mean, uh, you know, obviously you're part of the, you know, both seasons, but really sort of, did you think of this as sort of like the, almost the continuation of Thanksgiving or? Interestingly, in a way, I think Thanksgiving kind of was just sort of the appetizer, you know, it was, it was the beginning of something that even honestly, we didn't know. Like I, I, I was just having fun, you know, and was excited to explore and to play and to kind of have an episode to myself, which was kind of nice. And uh, and what it did was it also led to Queen and Slim. I mean, that's where me and Melina got really tight. And I asked her while filming that, I, was, I think you should direct this movie I'm writing. She's like, we'll see. I don't know. Send it to me. Like that to me is like <laughs> classic <laughs> Melina. Um, but that to me is like what Master of None like does, you know, and also to it, it, you know, I'm doing something like a audible TV show with Ken Whitley, even though I loved Ken Whitley before, I was sort of like, you need to have your own thing. I kind of did to a Ken what Aziz did to me, <laughs> like you're there's something here. And so I think, and obviously Angela Bassett, like that was just sort of the power of when you put a bunch of black women together on a set, like you're gonna get something really special and unique. And I think that I, I don't, I definitely got to give the guys credit for, for saying there's something here, let's keep building on this, <laughs> you know, there's something interesting. And, uh, and I think, it was like going back home though, when we came back together. Yes, there was a long uh, break, but I think we all needed some time to grow up, to do our own thing. You know, I really do like look at it like a band, like we're a band and we ought to go make some solo albums, <laughs> you know, and, um, but then we came back together and we did something different. And I, you know, I, I love writing with Aziz. I think we have a really easy back and forth. There are things I bring, there are things that he brings that just sort of makes for a very unique marriage. And, and then Alan's always say he's like the tiebreaker if we kind of reach an impasse, he's always like, come on, you know, and, but there's never any like hurt feelings or any ego or anything. It's just sort of like, okay, great. We just seem to always kind of go with whatever else. It's <laughs> like, okay, this is what we should do. So it just kind of felt like family and that's what it always feels like. And you fight like family, you love like family, you bicker like family. But what we were able to come out with was really nice in that I was in a space to, to deliver a very honest performance because it's just where my life was. And Aziz was really ready to just sort of get behind the camera, obviously. Mm -hmm. I think he'd been itching to do that for a while. And I think this was just such a great opportunity. And then, you know, and Alan was again, like sort of our person, sort of being our, our second pair of eyes and ears, just sort of checking in with Aziz. And I was actually talking with Alan way more than I feel like I even like normally, it was just, it, we were very much connected. It was very an emotional experience. And then Naomi was really, I think the secret sauce this season in that we've all been on the show. People know what it was like, but we needed a breath of fresh air. And, and I think that, you know, Naomi's the heartbeat of the season, which is really nice. Uh, for sure. Uh, Naomi, can you talk about the process of getting cast? Uh, and what was your reaction when you got the call? And, 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 you know, and I'd like to, to hear about what your expectation was based on what you knew about Master of None and, and what this season turned out to be. Yeah, I think that was the thing. Like, I remember when I, when I got the kind of message to say, oh, do you want to audition for this? I, I was like, obviously, I'd loved it. And my thing was initially like, I, I'm not funny. Like I'm not, and I'm not like, especially if I try, I'm, I'm yeah, people laugh at me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and, um, and so like, I, I don't know. I, I think 
initially I was like, okay, I'm very much in terms of acting and stuff, like try things that you don't necessarily think you're good at and figure out as you go along. So there was that sense. And then when I talked to Aziz and when I read the the extracts of the scripts I was given, I was like, oh, this is different. This, this feels different, but also for me, still quite intimidating, not only because of the people I would be doing it with, these ones, but, but, um, but also like the intimacy of the script, there was a, a real truth to it that you just couldn't hide away from. That was like quite daunting because I, I, and I think Lena, you said it at one point, but it's like you give a part of yourself. You're like, there is so much of us, even though it's not our particular stories, there's so much of us in there that you're like, you're really handing something over. And I'd never done it in that way before. Um, so that was why it was it was daunting as well. But then you know you get on set and you're just like ah, f it, let's just go in and <laughs> <Exactly. F> in. <laughs> right. um, yeah, I mean, the, I, I, the, the 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 script is so intimate, so uh, so vulnerable. I, I think that this idea of a real truth is 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 powerful. And and is there and as a performer, were, were you? Were you scared by that? I mean, you know, how did you, um, you know, how did you give yourself up to such a powerful script? Is that for me? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, up. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do I give myself over? You know, I think there is like a level of surrender that I think you have to do. There's like a, there's the preparation, which, which is what we had in the lead up. And then you get on set and it's like, doctor theater or something where you're like it's all or nothing it's now or never so you just go you know what like I'm here I said yes I'd do it even if not some and some of the things we were tackling with Alicia were hitting me on a on a deeper core but it's like in that moment you can either like build up a wall which the camera sees because it sees everything or or you just go ah here it is and I think that yeah it was daunting but at the same time it's given me a sense of freedom and permission in my next jobs to try and do that same thing more often um mm. because you just don't want to hide when you get in front of the camera I just don't want to hide I don't you just right. it is what it is you know mm. Mm. um Aziz when you began preparing for this season uh, uh, this the the preparations in the pre-production was before COVID right yeah so, you know, can you talk about sort of how you guys were thinking about this season and then how all of what the world has changed uh, affected the, your plans? Uh, well, it's pretty interesting because, <clears throat> you know, we were in London in, you know, like February, March, I guess. And you know, originally the season was supposed to have five other episodes, another story that was going to star me. But that script had a lot of things that made it not COVID friendly. Right. And uh, so in March, whenever they called, like we were ready to do both stories and it was going to be 10 episodes and we'd done table reads, we'd done casting. And then we got this call in March that everybody in the world started getting where they're like, hey, this COVID thing seems a bit serious. We might like take a break for three weeks and see what's going on. I mean, Lena's supposed to fly in like in a couple of days. I think she was supposed to fly in the next day from L.A. to London. Yeah. to start. I got a call from my agent the day I was supposed to get on the plane. Yeah. And they're I mean, like, not yeah, we're just going to like put things on pause for like three weeks and just see what's going on with COVID. And then, of course, it was like, you know, it, the pandemic became what it became. Mm -hmm. And then around like. I think maybe like August, things started sh filming again in London. Production started going back. And, you know, it was such a weird time where I was like, I really want to make this stuff. Who knows what's going to happen with COVID? And like when COVID ends, is everybody going to be scrambling to shoot? And so me and Alan kind of called Netflix and Universal and we're like, hey, what about getting Master of None going back again? Things are starting to pick up in London. Now, the other script, obviously, there's things in there we can't do right now. Moments in love is two ladies in a house. Let's go. We can do this. It's two, it's the dream COVID script. It's two ladies in a house, you know, bickering for three hours. We can make this. <laughs> and, you know, 
It was scary because, like, you know, you don't want someone to get sick to make a fucking show and you don't know what's going to happen. And, and, you know, we talked to the doctors and everything and we looked at the script and we're like, you know what, this this is this this is achievable. And it's so strange because, like, when you look back, it, it looks like something you would have written to make during COVID. Right. But it, it was it was kind of like we were so in the mindset of rebelling against what the show was like. You know, I remember writing a thing in my notebook at one time of like no bars, no restaurants, which actually ended up being a huge help because it was always in the house, you know, and and I was watching a lot of Ozu films and Ozu films are always just like people in a house. So I was really into that idea. So it ended up being a huge blessing that we had the script and we were able to uh, do it, even even though, you know, COVID happened, the script was in a form where it didn't really affect we didn't have to really change anything I don't think I mean there were certain things like you know like at one point I think we talked about Angela Bassett being there in that scene um, right. but I think it ended up feeling so much more real being a phone call you know it, that it just felt like that was the only thing I think we really had to change you know I think otherwise it was kind of like we did everything that was in the original scripts from what I remember we didn't really have to change much yeah uh, speaking of the scripts, uh, Lena, this season of Master of None really does an incredible job of tying together more serious uh, storylines with some uh, lighter comedic comedic moments. Can you talk a, a little bit about that balance and uh, and 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 you know and how you approach that as both writer and actor? Yeah, well, I think for me, comedy and drama, I just, I love mixing the two. I think that's where I live. I think the great thing is, I think that's where Alan Aziz and myself really bonded because they, I think it's a big reason why they wanted to go do something on their own. Cause I think they wanted to break away from this like regimented, like half hour comedy rule book. And so it really just spoke to me, uh, just the level of authenticity that we try to bring to scripts and vulnerability. I think that's what was so exciting. And I could really pick up because Aziz and I wrote these oftentimes not in the same room. So toward the end, we were together and we're tweaking things in person. But for the most part, it was it's us emailing scripts back and forth. So I was noticing, you know, it was like Aziz would get real, real on the page and I would go, OK, well, then I'll get real. I'll, I'll get there with you. And so that was really exciting, you know, to as he was almost challenging me when he would send me a draft. And then I would challenge him. I would say no, like as a the black one, like I think it would be like, you know, we were really getting in there. And um, and once it came time to shoot it, that's when I was like, oh snap, now I gotta like deal with this. Um, but and, and that can be really hard. It's easier to write an emotional scene than it is to play it. So I think once I I got there and like you know, we, I have to bring myself. I don't want to hide. I have to be very vulnerable. And it just, it all lined up in the right way. And, and, and I, and Naomi definitely talked to Aziz and Alan and everybody about what we needed to feel comfortable. And that was also very, a, a growth moment, I think for all of us, because in order for the art to really work, the environment has to lend itself to that art and for it to sing. And that's really what happened. I mean, Aziz was always playing music in between, always making sure our energy was where it needed to be. Naomi and I really had to quickly figure out a shorthand <laughs> like and like how to talk to each other. And how and we also had a really great intimacy coordinator who was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, um, not just for sexual things, but for very emotional mm -hmm. things and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So we really, we really just approached everything with, with respect, I think, and with, you know, and, and for us, sometimes it's real grit and just being like, what do I need in this moment to give my best? And that was for everybody. And I, what I loved is that there was nothing that the crew or anybody on set wouldn't do to make sure myself and Naomi felt comfortable in order for us to give the most, these honest and, and intimate and vulnerable performances. So mm -hmm. it really just sort of came down to everybody raising their game and not being afraid to be different. And also we'll say too, I think a lot of people may assume, oh, did y'all center two queer black women because of the revolution? It was like, well, that would be a nice anecdote. But the truth mm -hmm. is we wanted to do this long before the world realized we should start centering black people <laughs> in things. And we, you know, we've always sort of been like, well, yeah, why not center Denise and her wife and a house and them going through the things that adults go through. Um, it just felt like a natural progression. Just to just to add to what Lena was saying, I think Alan has said something like this before as well. It's like, you know, I think what people sometimes don't realize is like, oh, when you do a story like 
like Moments in Love and you make it about two queer black women, you're actually doing yourself a humongous favor as a storyteller. Cause like, you know, if you did that story, you know, there was a moment I was on set and I was like, oh man, like, you know, I, I kind of miss acting. Am I like a complete idiot? Should I have just like made this like me and, and my wife and done a story with me? But then I was like, I had the second for that thought for like two seconds. Cause immediately afterwards I was shooting a scene with Lena and Naomi. And I was like, I've never seen this before. I've never seen this conversation with two yeah. women. If it was me and a woman talking, I've seen that a million times. I've seen two straight people talking about babies so many times. I ah. haven't seen two black women talk about it. And it just makes every scene feel so fresh. And it made every day on set feel exciting to me. Mm -hmm. And also, too, that's a sense of normalcy for so many people in this country, like for all the guys being like, where are the dudes? Uh, imagine how we felt being like, we don't even ask that question. Where are we? You know, we stopped mm -hmm. because no one ever has to serve us or, or speak to us. They just expect us to watch everything that's put in front of us. And so what's been so exciting, which obviously also the reviews and the, the feedback has been lovely and amazing. And it's, it's and, and not just because we're queer black women, I think, but because the work is honest and real and people are just seeing themselves in it. Um, a straight black guy texted me this morning to be like, man, I saw myself in that. It, and that oh. I think it's sort of, it's doing yeah. different jobs. It's showing for the, for the the dudes like that every story doesn't have to serve you. You know, yeah. you can watch a story that's not about your life. And if you're really paying attention, you'll see yourself in someone else. And that's when the art does the job of bringing society together, because you start to realize, like, I'm not that different from that person over there that I think I would have nothing in common with. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that's what's so exciting about the show as a whole. When you look back, I think mm -hmm. when people look back at the show and the whole body of it, they're going to realize that our mission really was to show people that like the person you ignore and the person that you think you don't, you wouldn't have an interesting conversation with could probably, you know, alter your life in a really beautiful way. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, that's, that's you, I think you really hit the nail on the head there. I didn't, and that was like, you know, so much of Moments of Love to me in that writing was just me and Lena talking on the phone. And I think both of us realizing how similar our yeah. feelings and fears and everything about relationships and work crossed over, even though being yeah. on paper two completely different people, just that shared space was, was really, really fascinating. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think it all comes from such a real place, right? It's like when we have conversations, you know, again, we're, we're such different people. We look different on this Zoom, right? It's, it's a lot of different looking people on the Zoom right now, right? And, and but it's, it's, it's the things you have in common. And I think that's honestly been such an animating spirit in Master of None since the inception, right? It's always been about that and about how we have more in common than we have that separates us. So, yeah. I, you know, we, we often put a spotlight on representation and the political, political ramifications of the show and how it reflects society or doesn't. But Ultimately, I, I, you know, it's totally what Aziz and Lena said, which is it's not just good in a certain uh, like a societal sense. It's good for the work. It's good for the viewer. It's good for the artist. It, it's depicting things that we haven't seen before. And that lends it this novelty, this newness and giving, you know, what else is art or what else is creative work other than to you know, do something like we said had, hasn't been done before. And, and, and just gives you that excitement and, and shows you a life and a point of view that you may not have seen before. So that's always been important to us, but it comes from a really organic, real place. I mean, for sure, I think that there is a real sense of universality in this uh, season that comes from being very specific and true to those specific details. And, you know, and one of, I mean, perhaps the best example of that is, uh, is um, uh, Alicia's uh, IVF journey. And I, you know, and I think that this is, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a hallmark of, of the, you know, a hallmark episode, a masterpiece. Naomi, can, can you talk about that, um, that journey and about your process in bringing this, this, this side of Alicia to life and, and what you knew about IVF going into it and how you approached that topic? Yeah. I actually think you you hit the nail on the head when it comes to like specificity, equals universality, I, I think is, is the best way. And I kind of, in, in work, I like to be as specific as possible, not necessarily with um, information ab about things, but the way that like my inner feelings connect with that thing. And so when it came to the IVF episode, I didn't actually 
know huge amounts about IVF and I wanted to keep it that way because Alicia would only know a certain amount as well. And I wanted to, there was uh, this weird split brain experience, I think, of trying to draw parallels between the intensity of working on a set to to an IVF if that makes sense like you can because in my head feelings the 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 catalyst of a feeling is always different but the feelings that sit within you sit in parts of your body that are usually the same feeling and so on days where it was like okay that you know I remember a specific day where I had like a day of being in the stirrups and oh my goodness I mean, for one, okay, right. We were we were in a convention center in East London in the middle of winter. So it just was really cold. But it's also like the feeling of like sitting in stirrups for hours and having my feet apart and, and that intrusive feeling of one camera crew being in the room, but that can't be helped, but also how it must feel as a woman. Well, how it does feel as a woman going to the gynecologist all the time. It's like, it's normal, but it's not normal and so I think there was this kind of play for me each day about how I could draw parallels to how I was feeling to to the work and does that make sense I feel like I just my head is exploding because I realized the IVF episode is also just and if you think about it it's like this weird analogy for filmmaking itself like if you're a director (laughs) you're a filmmaker you know, you go to you go to find your doctor. Those are your actors and your crew yeah. and everything. And then you yeah. go through this process, like all the monitoring and everything. Those are like your shoot days. And yeah. at the end, you're like, you got a baby. We did it. <laughs> and it's, it's gonna yeah. come out, and hopefully, you have a beautiful baby. And, and I think that's just, so that's just the thing to cut out. I thought that was the intention. We were going in. <laughs> yeah. think, like, literally like, have you guys read that theory about the movie inception that it's all i was about- gonna say it maybe think of inception <laughs> yeah Theo was the director and like joseph gordon levitt is like the you know the, wow. the, 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 the financier and tom hardy's the actor like this was all intended this is all a metaphor for filming this is what we're doing we're hey, women, women everywhere we're that have struggled to, uh, to go black this is nothing like making a damn movie okay <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. they're like i'd rather do that do that shit Okay. Yeah, every Try day of the week, right? <laughs> Deal with some personalities, okay? <laughs> rather than growing a child inside of you and pushing it out the vagina. Like, I'd much rather make a film, <laughs> personally. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, well, that uh, that's that's some gold right there. Uh, uh, Aziz, just uh, uh, <laughs> talking about... Um, uh, this IVF journey. Can you sh- can you share the the conversation that you had with your friend that that sort of um, at the coffee shop uh, about IVF? That sort of uh... yeah. I mean, I remember I was in London uh, and I talked to Lena, and w- we kind of we kind of always knew what was going to happen with Denise, where like the book comes out and it doesn't do well, and she's kind of in this spot. And then we were like, well, the, we should kind of check in with Alicia and see what's going on with her. And I, I, I remember telling Lena, like, well, I had a friend that like had a baby by herself. That could be interesting. And Lena was like, yeah, that sounds pretty dope. I think that could be cool. And so, you know, I was just writing. It was so funny because, you know, we didn't have a writer's room or anything. We were just kind of, you know, this is it. I, I was just in London, like, yeah, talking on the phone. And like, I was just in London. And, like, graphs, so I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. FaceTime audio. FaceTime audio. Yeah. Yep. Uh, always. So I'd like in, in like a coffee shop in London and, uh, you know, I, I just get kind of, I just kind of hit a point where I was a little bored uh, of writing. And so I went out and I called this friend and I was like, Hey, like, you know, I'd had dinner with her at some point when she told me she was going to do this. And then when I talked to her, she was actually seven months pregnant. And so, you know, I, I, when I talked to her, she told me the whole journey. And I think even as she was telling me the thing, she was realizing how crazy a journey it was. And, you know, once she finished this, I mean, she talked to me on the phone for like an hour or so. And when she finished, I was like, whoa, if I can, if I can get that on the page, that'll be something. And then I started watching a bunch of like documentaries and stuff. And I realized whenever you watch these documentaries, you really root for these women. You want them to get pregnant. You want it to work because, you know, it's such a, such a beautiful thing to want. And, um, you know, you're just rooting for them. And so I thought, oh, okay, this is, this is a, this is a really great um, 
story for, you know, in just terms of plot mechanics and just like, oh, you have a very clear goal. There's so many hurdles and you're just going to root for this person. And then, um, you know, I had a few friends that had done IVF and once I started talking to them, they really wanted, they were really excited by the idea of, of Mastodon doing something about this. And they were like, you have to do this. You like, this is something so many people are, are dealing with and, and, and no one's really talked about it and shown it on, on a show like this. And, you know, I think for Alan and I, when we hear things like that, that's like, oh, well, that's what, that's, you know, that's the goal for Master of None, right? And so, you know, I just talked to all these women and I talked to a lot of doctors and stuff. And, and um, yeah, that was, that was kind of it. And then, you know, when we were on set, we had, we had doctors on set and, um, you know, just making sure we got it right and, and, and really told the story as accurately as we could. But, yeah, I mean, look, in the end of the day, it's all, it's all Naomi. <laughs> you know, you know. Yeah. We're, we're all um, just blessed with Naomi's performance. So thank you. Uh, oh, Alan, Alan, I'm not listening. I'm not listening. <laughs> By the way, when you're asking about like Naomi and like how she got cast, it's so funny. Cause like Naomi, like people talk about Naomi, like the way, like people talk about like ayahuasca, like people are like what? <laughs> Naomi Aki. <laughs> I, I remember like, you know, cause Allison Jones was like, you should, you should, you should, you should look at Naomi Aki. And I know JJ Abrams a little bit. And so I asked him cause uh -huh. she was at Star Wars and she was like, he's like, Naomi's superhuman. You have to, you have to, be <laughs> you have to, be <laughs> he's unbelievable. Like just stop yeah. talking to me. Like you need to call business affairs right now. Like, you know, and everybody, just was just such a fan of hers. And uh, man, and I didn't, I hadn't, like, I, really and I didn't hear a ton of that and I hadn't seen Naomi yet. Like I hadn't, you know, and which I think was also great. You know, there wasn't yeah. really a whole ton of buildup. You know, it was just, okay, I had seen the, the tape. I seen the tape and then I didn't meet you until I was in London. We were in that room. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. And I think that really was good for me, because that way it could just be very natural. And I think Aziz and the cast and folks, cause I was very much, I try to be very present in it. Even when I'm auditioning, mm -hmm. I'm not actually really thinking about, I'm trying to just like do the scene. And then when I, when the person leaves then I kind of have a conversation, but I think for Aziz and I, it just made so much sense. And I think, and, and Alan, obviously you saw the tape of both of us and it was just so, it just, it was so clear. And I think after we went, we kind of went inside of the bar after I that, remember we had lunch. Yeah. It was just like so euphoric. We were just sort of like, <laughs> okay, I think we we may have this. It really <laughs> it was such a hard part to cast because Lena was so in the auditions, like we did one of our first auditions, and like, you know, it, it was so weird because we hadn't really heard it out loud much. You know, it was me and mm -hmm. Lena had read it together on the phone. Sure, and like yeah. I loved like my favorite thing is like. I was in London and Lena was in LA. So I would send her whatever I finished at the end of the day. And then I'd wake up in the morning and Lena's like left me a voice note, like, you know, like a four minute long voice note, like just talking about the script. And then she would just do some of the dialogue, like do like fight scenes. And then like, you know, if I was fighting like this at this point, I'd be like, well, where the fuck was you? And, then they'd be like, and, and, and I was just like laughing. It's like hearing this stuff and then like writing it down. And so, and then like, we would like, do like kind of informal table reads where I would read Alicia and like argue with Lita, which is so funny and weird. And so when we did the auditions, it was the first time hearing like two women like mm -hmm. read. It. And we did that first audition and like whenever this person that auditioned got out of the room, I like just jumped up and hugged Lena and she's like, what, is everything okay? I was like, you're gonna crush this. This is gonna be so good. I don't know who the fuck else just read, but you were amazing. And <laughs> We were doing the auditions and like, you know, it was hard because Lena was, I mean, you know, Lena's Denise, which is a character that people know before, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it gives her an advantage and like, she's arguing with these people in these scenes, like, you know, some, one of the scenes was like the divorce scene and stuff where they're mm -hmm. fighting. And yeah. I mean, Lena could just destroy these people in an argument. I'm like, <laughs> man, like, I'm not going to be on their side. Like Denise, Denise brought up a lot of good points. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Naomi was the first person that was like really able to go toe to toe with her in like a very charming way. Right. And like, it was, it was just something so special that I remember that, you know, me and Lena got lunch afterwards. And we were just like, damn, that was, 
that was pretty fucking charming what she did in there, you know? Yeah. And it, and, was, and it was funny because like, yeah. you know, the first time Naomi read it, she was like, okay. And then I was just like, hey, just, you know, maybe just like forget Alicia and just do it as Naomi. And then a light bulb went off <laughs> and she kind of got what me and Lena are doing. It's like me and Lena are like, hey, we don't know how to act. We're just like <laughs> pretending it's That's us to do it. <laughs> you want to come play with how we play? And then yeah. Naomi did it. And I was like, oh shit, you see? And yeah. uh, it was yeah. I love that. And I think what I learned is like, I, because I give Aziz and, and Alan a lot of credit in terms of, and also Allison Jones, obviously, who who is the mm. reason why we have even met. She, she, she brought me up. But the thing about it is what I learned from Aziz is like, don't be afraid if the person playing next to you is is even more interesting or stronger, like don't be afraid like, of not being the star, even though you're at the center. Mm. It's okay if the person next to you shines. Mm. And I think that to me was like, yes, because Aziz was like, Lena, you're great. This is great. But in a way it wasn't really all, of, it wasn't all about Denise. It wasn't all about me. It was about this unit. And, yeah. and if the unit didn't sing, then what would be the whole, what would be the point? If it was just, just about Denise, that felt very self-serving and like masturbatory. So mm -hmm. I think what was so great was that, oh, okay, here's this person. And for lack of a better like term, we actually, you now you're watching two people literally make love versus mm -hmm. me just sitting here like, oh, doing this whole thing. That's why mm -hmm. I was really excited. I remember saying this to you, Aziz. I was like, yo, Alicia has to be like, you know, that was a big thing for mm -hmm. me. Um, and I, and I was like, Alan, you probably heard it too. Like, I, I was just like, it was a big thing for me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just, I was like, Aziz, I'm like, don't have me out here looking like, you know, this is my leaving Las Vegas, or whatever. I don't know. I just was like, I really want to feel like right in terms of this sort of duo, and and that's why I was really, I think that's why both of us were super excited when we left that room because we we're like, okay, great. This I felt like really confident and comfortable, and you obviously were really excited too. And then Alan was like, oh my god, it was just that was the moment. I mean, so it's, it's a pretty like, wild thing to cast because you're ultimately you have a show that's been going on two seasons, right. and the new character is going to be in the show more than anyone else by right. a, a pretty decent margin. So it, it's it's a lot, you know. Yeah, you know, it was just ex exactly what they're saying. There were two quantum leaps, right? The first one was we had the scripts, but then let's have Lena be the lead of this, right? And then when she read, and, and, you know, we were in Allison Jones' office, it was like, mm -hmm. yeah, it was like we all gave each other hugs. And then afterwards, me and Aziz, we, you, Lena, you were there. We were like, we we're just like, oh my God. Like, because it's, you also watched Lena's growth as a performer, right? It's a, Remember, yeah. You know, you go back and watch season one. Like, go back and watch it's season crazy. one. It's crazy. But what Lena's doing in the show, and it's funny, right? It's great, but she's, you know, she's doing bit parts here and there and she's coming in she's a best friend type character and like to go from that and then to go to this that is a quantum leap right so we were like oh my god that's the yes. concept then you're like okay now we have to find someone as good as lena so then that <laughs> it's both of those things combined and when, when those two actors came together it's like oh my god now we can make the show right that's yeah. the show right it's like we that's can have we can shoot in a great way but this show is two people talking to each other so that's why it's like, oh my God, this it, the way we felt after both of those sessions, first Lena and then finding finding Naomi was like, oh my God, like we yeah. can make it. We can make it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also like, I think like what I was like, just like a sponge absorbing was like watching you, Lena, while you worked and being like, okay, I want to do that. Like I was like, I was there was this sense of just like, okay, like I, I've never done your type of performance before. And it was really interesting and honest. And I was like, okay, that's that's what I want to try for. So I was basing a lot of my, <laughs> a lot of, my of, of my stuff, like especially in the first like few weeks of just like, how does Lena move around the space? What is her tone? Because so much of it again is is about matching tones. Mm -hmm. You know, some stories are amazing, but if people are almost acting in different worlds, yeah it clashes and sometimes people don't even know why so like my biggest thing was like we have to live in the same world and like that was just it was but still be different from each other but, obviously. yeah it's still be like, different from was each so other crazy. yeah you but, guys yeah, have energy and I have mine but you believe that those two people lived in that house and like exactly. spent that time and I think that was what was so great yeah yeah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful conversation. Uh, I, 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 Aziz, I wanna build on this and talk a little bit about the filmmaking process. Um, even though you've directed episodes of the series before, this season you direct all the episodes. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, season three is a very intimate uh, piece of filmmaking. Uh, 
your approach to this season seems to be sort of like as a as, as one big piece, uh, certainly more so than than the first two seasons. Um, David Lynch called Twin Peaks the return an 18 hour movie. Mm-hmm. Moments of Love, uh, 188 minute film. Is it a TV show? Is there a difference to you? I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, you could watch it as a film. I, I do think there is a little bit of an advantage to having those little breaks in between. I mean, so many people have told me they're like, oh, yeah, I watched it all in one night. I'm like, damn, that's a heavy, heavy watch. <laughs> 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 Take some time there. Um, oh. But yeah, I mean, look, I think in terms of how we approached it, uh, you know, from the filmmaking side, definitely we approached it in terms of a film and try in terms of maintaining consistency. And, you know, normally in a series, you, you will have different directors, but for this, it just didn't feel right. It just felt like it was all such a cohesive piece. And I was so close to the material and, and, you know, it was so tight with me and Lena that like, I, you know, I think we, we wanted to make it as a unit. And, and to me, it was really about on set. It was, it was really about me, Lena and Naomi and us every day, just like looking at a scene and being like, how do we do this? And like, and it was cool because, you know, when we first shot, it was like, you know, it, it, it was a little scary because the style we wanted to do without moving the camera and, and without doing coverage, it was a little scary. We didn't know if it was going to work. And we shot like the fir- the scene where they talk about having a baby where where, where Lena says, uh, your ovaries are going to be lit. Oh, and that, that's, yeah. <laughs> Which Lena improvised on the very first audition. I was like, that's going in. That's amazing. Uh, Yeah. So we shot that and we shot a couple of different versions. Our DP Thimios, I was like, let's do every version we can with this. You know, let's just see like what's the most interesting show, right? So we did one where it was was just staying still. We did one where where Thimios kind of followed him and just was handheld and was grabbing close-ups. And we did one where we did kind of traditional coverage where we, you know, had some, some tighter shots and, and would go from wide to tight. And then whenever I watched them, the edit, and I sent them to Alan and, and the guys in LA, like we were, we were like, Hey, the show we want to be in is the one where the camera doesn't cut. You know, I, I think, you know, I mean, people have talked about like how we went for this style, but I think the important thing is the style really fit the story. Right. Uh, Cause what I found is, I just thought Lena and Naomi did such a good job of playing each other. Even when I watched the auditions, you know, I remember I set you guys, there was one you point where like at like, you know, it was like in, you know, COVID lockdown and, and, you know, we were just about to start, like, you know, we were, we were, we were going to shoot moments in love first. And, and, you know, we had Naomi and we were about to start rehearsal. So we were all kind of bummed that we weren't going to get to start this adventure. And I had the footage of, of the auditions. And I, I strung those together and put some of the Jesse Norman opera music under it. And I, and I sent it to uh, Lena and Naomi. I texted them. I was like, hey, we, we will make this. I know we will. I believe in this. We'll do it. I promise you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I, but when I was watching those auditions, I was like, man, they're so good at, at playing off each other. Like, I don't want to cut and go to a different take and be in a different moment. Like, what's, what's so special about these performances is like, whenever you see that take, like, yeah, that was that moment. You know, that was the energy that they were both giving. That's how they played off each other. That was real, you know? Mm-hmm. And whenever I look at stuff, when I looked at stuff where we had a close up maybe, and we cut to the close up, it just kind of reminded me that I was watching something. You know what I mean? It kind of broke the spell, you know? And I think that's the power of long takes. Like if you watch something like Roma and you see the scene where she's having the baby, like that's all one take. And if you cut in that, I think it, you would you would break the spell. And what's great is when you don't even notice that's what's happening. I mean, the, you know, the Reverend Roma again, like the scene where she saves him in the water, like I didn't think about it till afterwards. I was like, oh fuck, it never cut. Like, and, and it's just kind of powerful. And for these performances and the scenes we were doing, to not cut and really hold with them, I, I thought I thought really uh, really worked well for us. I think I think in modern filmmaking and television as well, there's there's kind of an arms race, right? It's like, oh my god, the, the audience is losing their attention, right? They have no oh, attention. Oh. Got to keep cutting, got to keep cutting, and and we're, we're now to the point where like there's a cut every three seconds, every two seconds, every one second, right? And so this was kind of like, right. you know, what? we're gonna do the opposite of that. We're gonna we're gonna trust the audience. We're gonna believe in them. We're gonna trust their intelligence and have them kind of immersed in this world. This kind of, you're a fly in the wall of this relationship. And I, I think the additional sort of benefit of that is 
when you do go to a close up, which is like episode four, <laughs> it's like you've watched three or four episodes of, and there's a close up of Naomi, like a high angle close up. It's like, oh my God, this is one of the most powerful close ups I've ever seen. Because you right. two hours or something. Yeah. Oh my God, here's finally a close up of someone's face. Yeah. 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 I've heard a lot of great feedback from people. It's like people aren't like, oh my God, I can't watch this. It's like, I felt like I was hypnotically yeah. interested in this relationship, which is I kind of that. going yeah. for. Oh, and when you read about people that that kind of, you know, uh, uh, the writer, director, Paul Schrader wrote this book that I read uh, when we were kind of in prep. It's all about like this kind of cinema, slow cinema. And I can't remember who he quoted saying this, but it's like when you shoot that way, like the audience gets to make their own close ups. You know, they can choose who they want to do a close up on. You know what I mean? And if, if you believe in the audience and believe in your performances, like you, they'll get their close-ups in a weird way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And also too, just doing, look, doing a one is, can get you home early, but it can also be annoying. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but I know that at the same time, shooting that way, it gave us some freedom to really yeah. l- l- sink into the scene. Mm-hmm. And it felt like it was about the scene, about the work. You know, I, I definitely think I heard some podcasts that were saying, oh, I kind of wish we could have gotten in their faces a little bit more during some of the arguments. But I think to me, that almost would feel invasive. Yeah. You know? To, yeah, you yeah. broken the spell. Like, them, yeah. yeah. When you yeah. watch that fight that you guys have at the end of episode two, like mm-hmm. if we did close-ups, like the energy just wouldn't be the same. Like the way you guys are in that take, that was the energy, you know? And that was it. And that was, that fight feels so real and raw because of it. If we yeah. did another take and I said, hey, do that again, you're not gonna be able to do the same thing. It's just no. not gonna feel the same. And when you cut between them, I mean, I remember like editing fight scenes from like season two and stuff and, and like trying to like pick the best pieces from different takes. And then at a certain point I was like, what is this? This is not a real thing. And right. it kind of really planted the seed of like doing it this way where it's like, hey, we're gonna stay, we're gonna stay with them and, and just, the pauses and everything is going to be real. We're not going to manipulate that with editing. We're not going to, the pauses. And, and that was the thing we learned is like, I feel like silence is dialogue, you know, like there were times where like, I, I remember like, you know, even little things like there was a thing where Lita's at the end of episode uh, uh, two and she's like standing, looking at the window uh, and, oh, yeah. um, and, 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 and I just go, Lita. And then she like steps away and, and it's like, it's like really timing all those silences and the spaces yeah. and, and, and all of that, you know, it creates a mood and, a, and an effect. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're sort of rounding the corner on this guy. Uh, this has been an amazing conversation. I want to sort of uh, end uh, or, or uh, at least ask one last big question uh, to Lena. Um, uh, throughout the whole series, we see characters struggling to find success and balance in both their careers and personal lives. Mm-hmm. We see Denise here in season three at a real high point in her career, uh, but success brings with it anxiety, isolation, maybe even fear. Mm-hmm. Can you speak to making this, this theme about uh, success and, 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 and that, that journey? Uh, like what, what, what did that mean to you as an artist? Uh, it was, it was a culmination of a lot of moments in my own life and as an artist to the, to get to that point, to be there with what I consider my brothers, you know, and in, in life and in arms uh, and in art. But yes, yeah, like we, we began this journey together and they've watched my life change. They've watched, they've had a front row seat to it. <laughs> They're a big reason why, you know, I'm, I'm able to sit in the seat that I sit in. Um, and, and for that, I'm, I'm really grateful. And I think I have such a unique relationship with just with even the word success, because mm-hmm. I think that society has told us what success is supposed to be. And we've sort of been tricked into believing that success means abundance. It means uh, constant joy. And it means maybe some form of approval or validation. And the truth is success sort of, um, sort of puts you in a space where it becomes hard to relate to other people that you've known forever. It puts you in a space where 
people see you differently. Um, and it does make it so you then become, you have a different kind of loneliness. You're surrounded by all the things you want and all the people that you, that were there before the success sometimes can, can go away. And I think that, and then yet you have people looking from the outside in saying, oh, I want that. Like, mm -hmm. even that's what I love when Dev sort of comes over and says, you got it figured out. Yeah. You know, and that's because Dev and Denise have bought into this idea of what success is supposed to be. And so that to me is what's so exciting <laughs> is that we're challenging the audience to, to not believe that the house and the, the marriage and the hopefully maybe the kid and the career, like that's not necessarily what you should be chasing because when you get there, you're gonna find yourself to be kind of bored, to be kind of lost um, and to be a little melancholy. And so for me, is like, I'm trying to always find joy and, um, but also embrace, you know, the darkness when it comes mm -hmm. and, and not, not try to push it away, but to understand that it's a part of the journey. Mm. I mean, that, that, that feels very, very real. Um, and, and I feel like the, the, there, the, there is a message of, of, of success in this story and, it, and it's that, that success is real love and it's the, it's the challenges mm -hmm. of love, the, 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 the highs and the lows. Um, and I feel like that's, 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 that's a beautiful thing that, that anybody can relate to, whether you're an artist, whether you're a factory worker, whether Definitely. you're queer, whether you're straight i mean it's it, it's a universal thing that i think that you guys have really really nailed um oh, and and and, I, and it's a big congratulations to all of you guys um is there anything i, I mean that's that's my takeaway on the show no, for what it's you. worth that's uh pretty beautiful uh, yeah what do you, you know you've had a, a moment uh you know people have seen it do we, there's been some some amazing reviews what do you hope that people take from this aziz um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I think it, it's kind of what, you know, you were just saying. And, and look, I think like if you look at all of the seasons, every episode, what's strange is you watch if you watch Moments in Love, like all the ideas are in seasons one and two, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. a, years about having a kid, your relationship with your parents, uh, infidelity, um, you know, representation. Uh, it's all there, you know, it's just, it's just kind of a lot of these same themes, but I think ultimately, you know, what the, the theme that we kind of tend to gravitate towards is ultimately like, look, ultimately at the end of the day, like, you know, push all the other shit aside. It's really just about your friends and your family. It's about the people in your life and your relationships with them. That's, that's ultimately all it comes down to. Yeah. Amen. I agree. Mm. Good that. stuff. Well, yeah. um, I want to thank everybody on this panel for for a, a very lively conversation, a very honest conversation, uh, uh, energetic. Um, uh, I want to thank 92nd Street Why Talks Events for for hosting this. Uh, and I want to thank all the viewers for for spending time uh, with all of us and, and listening about uh, what is what is really an amazing, amazing achievement and a, and a wonderful show. And so uh, if, if you haven't, please watch uh, season three, Master of None presents Moments in Love on Netflix. Um, it's a, it's I, I promise you, you'll you'll come away uh, 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 very, very happy. Um, <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye.